This is the unusual story because uh, seven generations in a company like us, ours, in the spirits business, uh, there are probably two or three around the world. The Luxardo family makes cocktail liqueurs, an endeavor they have pursued for nearly two centuries. Collectively, they've overcome devastating obstacles through the years as the world changed around them. Though what hasn't changed is the dedication to their craft, which has long served as the family's touchstone. This is the story of the Luxardo family and one of the most prized cocktail ingredients in the world. founder of the company, Girolamo in Italian and Jerome in, uh, in English. He moved uh, to the city of Zara uh, in 1817, if I'm not wrong, with his wife and three children. Girolamo Luxardo was a trader. He was selling uh, ropes for the Italian Navy, uh, coral and laces. Uh, then uh, he was appointed as a consul of the Kingdom of Sardinia. Uh, those days was the Kingdom of Sardinia was the beginning of the Kingdom of Italy and he was sent to Zara. The city of Zara, also known as Zadar, is located on the coast of the Adriatic Sea across from Italy in what is today known as Croatia, but at the time was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, he found that this area in Zara had uh, uh, in, the in the back of the city there were uh, unusual cherry trees, very sour. In those times it was common in Italy and I think presume uh, all around Europe to produce a cordial, homemade cordial. And she was producing this product called Rosolio Maraschino. Giromo's wife, Maria Canevari, she was the actual uh, lady who was making the Maraschino initially because uh, she was making this kind of rosolio at home that they were offering to all their guests when they were having lunch or dinner, and everybody found this product uh, extraordinary. Girolamo said, well, there could be a business behind this, and he refined the recipe, and in uh, 1821 he started the first Luxardo company. The Luxardo business in Zara took off and quickly expanded, due in part to the company's focus on exporting its liqueurs to other countries and the emergence of cocktail culture around the world. Since cocktails were invented in the late 1800s, uh, Maraschino was present uh, almost all around the world. Uh, and um, the fathers of mixology uh, were using Maraschino as a sweetener inside their, their drinks. I was given a piece of, uh, of a journal uh, coming from New Orleans, 1839, where they're selling our Maraschino. Hey, New Orleans, 1839, can you imagine? And the only reason to have it on the spot was evidently a cocktail. Success would continue for the Luxardo family until the early 20th century, when a series of events would change everything. It began with World War I, which had an impact on the family, though they survived and continued operating. World War II, however, was a different situation. Well, the family was <laughs> challenged quite a lot by history because, you know, uh, being founded in 1821, it had to suffer two world wars. And this is something that uh, my grandfather and my father and uh, even Frank today always uh, remembers and uh, we chat about. Uh, in between the First World War and the Second World War, the company was one of the biggest uh, distillery in, in Italy. Second World War arrived, uh, the city of Zara was bombed 57 times. Uh, the distillery uh, was uh, bombed by Anglo-American forces uh, in 1944. The bombing w went on for a full year. And uh, as a consequence, 80% uh, of the city was destroyed. The distillery was uh, almost completely destroyed. The house where we were living was damaged but not destroyed. So the company had to escape, obviously, because the partisans of Tito, the communists, arrived in the city and they started killing and kicking out all the, all the Italians. Uh, one of our aunts, that she left Zara with a rowboat 
uh, they were rowing uh, during the night to avoid uh, shooting. And uh, during the day, they were hiding on the, in the islands. Uh, and so my father was the only one to survive of the four brothers because uh, he was on the mainland in Italy and with us. Uh, he, had, he was in the army and uh, in 1943-44 we were all displaced in a small village near Trieste, between Venice and Trieste. So when the company uh, was destroyed back in, in 1945, Giorgio Luxardo, Franco's father, uh, had to rebuild uh, all the company from, from zero. As soon as the war was over, uh, my father uh, went around uh, he, he did not know yet if uh, starting the company again because he had a good name, he had uh, the recipes, but uh, no money at all, and uh, did not know what was, what was the future. But uh, the, he decided to go ahead, uh, not only because there were, there was, he has his immediate family with him, because, but also because the women and the children of the, his brothers were there. And so he wanted to continue uh, and so in 1947, he managed to find uh, a suitable uh, place where to rebuild uh, this dream uh, here in Torreglia. We are in a small town, it's called Torreglia. It's uh, on the foot of the uh, Euganian hills uh, near Padova. Padova is uh, one of the oldest cities in Italy, nobody knows that, but it's more than 5,000 years old. Uh, the Euganian hills are all inactive, ex-inactive uh, volcanoes, so the pH of the soil is uh, very similar to the one we have in Zara, and is particularly uh, perf um, suitable for growing Maresca cherry trees. The company in, in Zara used to be right in the city center. When bombings occurred, uh, the company got destroyed completely. So Torreglia was outside a city centre. So in case of future bombings, uh, the company would have been safe. And then the fifth generation, he, he himself as a fort, he had a, 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 another, the oldest of my cousins working with him, he was only 19. And then little by little, uh, another cousin, Michele, Michael, joined and I joined in 1960 and so the fifth generation took over. The first three or four years uh, we didn't have production yet because we planted the cherry trees, this Marasca cherry trees, this is this area, uh, thanks to collaboration of University of Florence. A professor from the uh, University of Florence, he was a botanist, he went from uh, Florence to Zara uh, to talk with my uh, grandfather uh, because he was interested in this uh, uh, cherry called the Malaska cherry. So my grandfather gave him a few plants that he took back to, uh, to Florence, he planted them. And so he started the production of uh, Malaska cherries with our plants in, uh, in Florence. My grandfather, when he got here, he remembered this. He went to Florence. And uh, this helped us, helped my father a lot, because first of all, this person gave him the technical knowledge, the botanical knowledge, and next, he helped him to select this area for the best possible soil in northeastern Italy to plant new orchards. And this is how it all started. The cherries from Florence were coming from Zara, and then we plant them here. And all the, since then, all the cherry plants were clones. Uh, so we had the, the, the opportunity to give our name to the, to the cherry. Uh, it's a special variety that is a little bit smaller than the other Marasca, uh, Marasca cherries. In 1999, I probably I think we managed to give our name to the to the variety. Cherry blossom is one of the best things to see because just all of a sudden you have completely around all white trees, bright white trees, which are lovely to see. The Marasca cherries are harvested in the summer each year, beginning their journey of transformation into Luxardo Maraschino. First, the cherry pulp, skins, branches, and leaves are infused into neutral alcohol in larchwood vats for two years or more. The solids are then removed and put into yuta bags, which are like large tea bags, and put into a pot still with the infused alcohol. This is distilled to obtain Maraschino distillate, 
which is then matured and finished ashwood vats for 9 to 12 months, at which time water and sugar is added in the finished Luxardo Maraschino bottled. The bottle is uh, very, very unusual. The bottles which used to be brought in from Venice, the Murano glass, famous uh, glass works, they were breaking in the, in the boat uh, uh, trip. People used to wrap the bottles the, with straw to prevent any damage. Uh, so the bottles, when they were coming inside the, the company in Zara, we had to take away the straw it was placed in Venice, place the label and then wrap them again and then ship them. Girolamo, who was a very clever man, found out that if he was going to place the actual label on top of the straw, that would save a lot of money and a lot of time. So that's why since that day we, we still have the label of the maraschino placed on top of the, of the straw. When we came here, uh, they, we wanted to keep, it, it had become a very important trademark for us. The round bottle with the straw was registered at uh, Luxardo all over the world, it still is. This means that we had to keep that uh, tradition. We still do it by hand here in, inside the company because as I was telling you, tradition to us is, is very important and so we want to keep all the different uh, steps of the making of the maraschino uh, the most traditional as possible. The story of the Luxardo family is a story that continues today, with the seventh generation beginning their work to take Luxardo into the future. There's Niccolo Luxardo, who has begun to learn the craft of overseeing Luxardo's business in countries around the world, something he is learning from his cousin, Matteo Luxardo, who himself learned it from his father, Franco Luxardo. And then there's the other new addition from the seventh generation, representing something very exciting for the Luxardo family. So my sister uh, entered the company January last year. Uh, and uh, she is the first uh, uh, Luxardo female to enter the Luxardo company in almost 200 years. And we're very happy uh, for her to be with us. And uh, her role is mainly uh, learning the job my father has done for the last uh, 40 years. Uh, and uh, she brought to the company something very interesting and something very important. Uh, she did uh, her uh, university degree uh, it was the project to implement the uh, production of the cherries and to implement the, the bottling line. Uh, not only she got a very good uh, points on the, on, the, on the degree, but her plan now is built here in the, in the company, so it's, uh, it was very important for us. The story of the Luxardo family is one of the great sagas in drinking culture. And even beyond the devastation of the two world wars, the second half of the 20th century presented its own challenges to the family. Most notably that drinking culture had lost its connection to classic cocktails, and by extension, Luxardo. We had a declining of, uh, of interest on the Maraschino. And it's, I think it's in the last 15 years, 10, 15 years, that we had a renaissance of the usage of the product and of the uh, people that is now more and more interested in the product. We are continuously planting new orchards. That's mainly due to the fact that in the last like 10 years, uh, this come back to uh, very classic cocktails and this come back to uh, the finest mixology that you have around the world uh, has brought uh, back the light on Maraschino cherries and Sango Morlacco. It is the flagship, uh, but it's not only that. Uh, it's everything. I mean, we are the only one nowadays in the world to make Maraschino uh, properly, let's put it this way, in the traditional way. It really resembles uh, what our family is and what we do because it's very complex to make, it's very long to make, uh, but at the end when you're sipping, at every sip of, of this product, you can really feel everything that is related to, to our history. It's a history that is still being written to this day, though the continuation of the Luxardo story is not a foregone conclusion. It requires the commitment and passion of each new generation to maintain its vitality, a responsibility that is not lost on Franco Luxardo. I want to transfer that to, to, to the younger generation, so either Matteo or his younger cousins, in order to make sure that there is a future 
Uh, I had a brother, for instance, who decided to be a, a, a medical doctor. He was 17, he selected his own career. Other members of the family have done the same. Uh, I am one of those who's, who kept going, and uh, I hope that uh, everybody else who follows in the same in the other generation will do the same. I hope that we'll always be somebody here uh, doing what I'm doing now for you.